That's not Doris. She was here a minute ago. Mm, I wonder where she's got to. Morris, it's me, Jane. Oh, hello, Jane. Have you seen my sister anywhere? Yes. We've just been looking at the map of Magic Mountain together. The trouble is, it's rather heavy, and poor old Doris can't carry it. Not so much of the old, thank you, Jane. Sorry. Uh, Doris, you were going to tell me about the last time you looked at the map. Oh, yes, so I was. This story's called The Growing Stream. One morning, I was woken up by the sun streaming in through the windows. The birds were singing noisily in the trees. Wake up, wake up, sleepyhead, I said to Morris. Summer's really here at last. We both ate our breakfast very quickly. It's such a lovely day, we must do something special, said Morris. I know. Let's have a picnic, I said. We could go to Pea Green Park. Oh, yes, said Morris. I love it there. It's so green, it's like being under the sea. Pea Green Park is in a lovely valley surrounded by trees. You've never seen so many flowers, and there's a stream running through it. I'll pack the picnic, said Morris, who makes delicious sandwiches, and you fetch a rug for us to sit on. Soon we were ready, and after walking and walking and walking, we arrived at Pea Green Park. Oh, I'm so thirsty after that walk, said Morris. I'm going to have some lemonade. Now, where did I put it? We looked everywhere, but we couldn't find the lemonade. Oh, dear, said Morris. I must have forgotten to pack it. Oh, you careless hamster, I said. Never mind, said Morris. I'll drink some water from the stream. He dipped his glass in again and again and drank glasses and glasses of ice-cold water. <sighs> Don't drink any more, <sighs> Morris. You'll burst. Morris stood up. I do feel rather funny, he said. I stared at him. <gasps> Morris, you're getting bigger. Bigger and bigger. Can't you stop? No, I can't, said Morris. And I'm not sure I want to. I'm twice as tall as you now. I'll soon be able to pick the cherries high up on this tree. Yum, yum! Morris wasn't at all worried, but I was. Supposing you never become small again, I said. You won't fit into your bed. You won't even get through our front door at this rate. I think we'd better go home and I'll find a spell to make you small. All right, but first I'll just eat a few more cherries, said Morris. Oh, he's so greedy. I had to run to keep up with Morris on the way home. He took huge steps and he was still getting bigger. While I was looking for my book of spells, I came across an old map of Magic Mountain. Look, Morris, it says here that the stream in Pea Green Park is called the Growing Stream. Ah, no wonder the water made you so big. Morris looked down from a great height. But what can we do, he said. I'm beginning to feel uncomfortable and my fur's gone all tight. I leafed through my book of spells as quickly as I could. Hang on, Morris, I said. I'll try this one. Bing, bang, bong. Oh, what a surprise. Hamsters must be hamster size. There was a funny hissing sound, like an untied balloon, and Morris became smaller and smaller and smaller until at last he was the same size as me again. Thank goodness for that, he said. I thought I was going to burst. Now, where's our picnic? I'm starving. What are you doing, Jane? Jumping! Whoopee! It makes me taller. You're only taller when you're up in the air. When I got taller, it was magic that did it. Don't be so mean, Morris. Not everyone can do magic. Sorry, Jane. That's all right, Morris. And jumping is fun, isn't it? Yes. Of course it is. Let's sing the jumping song. 
there was a man and he went mad He jumped into a biscuit bag The biscuit bag it was so full He jumped into a roaring bull The roaring bull it was so fat He jumped into a gentleman's hat The gentleman's hat it was so fine He jumped into a bottle of wine The bottle of wine began to crack So he jumped back into a biscuit bag there was a man and he went mad There he was a man a and he went mad He the jumped into bag. a biscuit bag He jumped into a roaring bull He jumped into a roaring bull The roaring bull it was so fat He jumped into a gentleman's hat The gentleman's hat it was so fat He jumped into a bottle of wine He jumped into a bottle of wine So he jumped back into a biscuit Crag. That's the sort of song you could go on singing forever and ever. Doris, you could go on singing any song forever and ever. Well, singing makes me happy, and I do so want to be happy. I want to be happy ever after. Ever after what? Oh, you know, like in stories. They say things like, and so Doris and Morris lived happily ever after. Oh, I see. I love to hear a happy ever after story. Well, you're in luck, because Denise is going to tell us one. It's the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> there lived a beautiful princess called Snow White. Her mother, the queen, had died when Snow White was very young. And one day her father brought a new queen to live in the palace. The new queen was very beautiful too, but she was also proud and cruel. In her bedroom was a magic mirror. She would often ask it, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? And the mirror always answered, Beautiful queen, you know it's true. No one on earth is lovelier than you. Then the queen was happy. But every day, little Snow White grew lovelier and lovelier, until one day the magic mirror said to the queen, you, O oh Queen, are beautiful, it's true, but Snow White is far lovelier than you. When the Queen heard this, she was jealous and angry, and she called her huntsman. Take Snow White into the forest and kill her, she ordered. The huntsman took Snow White into the forest, but he couldn't bring himself to kill her. Run away as far as you can and never return, he said to her. Then he hurried back to the palace. Snow White is dead, he told the queen. And she believed him. Meanwhile, alone in the forest, Snow White was very frightened. She walked and walked until she came upon a little cottage, almost hidden by the trees. The door was open. So she went in. There was a table set with seven little plates and seven little loaves of bread. And there were seven little chairs by the fire and seven little beds against the wall. She ate one of the little loaves and then fell asleep on one of the little beds. She did not wake up even when the seven dwarfs who lived in the cottage came home. They had been busy all day digging for gold in the mountains. Look! cried one of the dwarfs. Someone has come to visit us. Isn't she beautiful? Don't let's wake her, said another dwarf, and they tiptoed away. Snow White awoke next morning to find the seven dwarfs all watching over her. She was a little scared at first, but the dwarfs looked so kind, she told them who she was and how the wicked queen had tried to kill her. Stay with us, Snow White, the dwarfs begged. But make sure you never open the door to anyone while we are out. They knew that if the wicked queen found out where Snow White was, she would try to harm her again. Of course I'll stay, said Snow White. 
I'll look after you while you look after me. And they all lived happily together in the little cottage. At the palace, the queen again asked her mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror answered, in a cottage near to here, O queen, lives Snow White, the fairest ever seen. The queen flew into a rage and decided to be rid of Snow White once and for all. She dressed up as a fruit seller and searched the forest until she found the cottage. She knocked at the door. The dwarfs told me not to open the door to anyone, thought Snow White. But I could just peep out of the window. She saw a kind-looking old woman. Try one of my juicy red apples, my dear, said the woman. Thank you, said Snow White, and took a big bite. At once she fell to the floor and lay as if she were dead for the wicked queen had poisoned the apple. When the dwarfs came home, they could do nothing to wake Snow White. We will place our beautiful Snow White in a glass case on the hill and watch over her every day, said the dwarfs. And this they did for many years. One day, a handsome prince came riding by and saw Snow White. Who is that beautiful girl? he asked the dwarfs. They told the prince Snow White's story and helped him to lift the glass case. As they did so, the piece of poisoned apple fell from Snow White's lips and she woke up and smiled. The prince and the dwarfs were overjoyed. The prince said, Will you marry me, Snow White, and live in my castle? Oh, yes, said Snow White. I would love to live with you in your castle. So she kissed all the dwarfs goodbye and rode away with the prince. When the queen heard that Snow White was still alive, she smashed the mirror into a thousand pieces. At once, her own lovely face grew wrinkled and the beautiful, wicked queen turned into a feeble, withered old lady. The dwarfs danced all night at Snow White's wedding and came to stay at the castle every Christmas and Easter. And as for Snow White and her prince, they lived happily ever after in the castle. Doris, I like happy ever after stories too. Yes, they make you feel happy, don't they? Nigel's got a happy poem, you know. It's called Five Fat Peas. Five fat peas in a pea pod pressed. One grew, two grew, and so did all the rest. They grew, and they grew, and they grew, and they grew. They grew so fat and portly that the pea pod popped. Look, Jane, make your hands into a pea pod and then your fingers can be the peas growing. What happens when the pea pod pops? You clap your hands. Let's hear it again. Five fat peas in a pea pod pressed. One grew, two grew, and so did all the rest. They grew and they grew and they grew and they grew. They grew so fat and portly that the pea pod popped. <laughs> Hello, Morris. Hello, Doris. Have you seen Jane anywhere? Yes, she's gone to look for a handsome prince like Snow White's. And I've asked her to keep an eye out for a prince for me, too. Gosh, you girls are so soppy. I wanted Jane to help me look for my gloves. Gloves? How boring. Well, they're mittens, actually. 
and they're not at all boring. They keep my paws lovely and warm. The three little kittens mum didn't think mittens were boring. Listen to the song. Three little kittens, they lost their mittens, so they began to cry. Oh, mother dear, come here, come here, for we have lost our mittens. Lost your mittens, you naughty kittens, then you shall have no pie. They found their mittens, so they began to cry. Oh, Mama dear, come here, come here, for we have found our mittens. Found your mittens, you good little kittens, now you shall have some pie. Now we shall have some pie. Now we shall have some pie. Look, here's Jane. Jane, have you seen my mittens anywhere? No, Morris. I haven't been looking for your mittens. I've been looking for a handsome prince to marry me. But I can't find one anywhere. Never mind. Maybe you'll marry a prince when you're grown up. I am quite grown up. Yes, but you're not really big like, um, oh, like, uh, oh, like an elephant. I wouldn't want to be as big as an elephant. No, it can be tricky if you're elephant-sized. Mm. Listen to Carol's story. Rodney's Wash Day. <laughs> Mr Pinkerton was the elephant keeper at the zoo. He looked after Rodney, who was the biggest elephant Mr Pinkerton had ever seen. Here you are, Rodney, Mr Pinkerton would say as he staggered into the elephant house carrying a huge bundle of hay. Here's your elevenses. Mr Pinkerton could not even carry Rodney's lunch. He had to use a wheelbarrow for the apples and cauliflowers, bananas and bread that Rodney liked. You are a big lad, Mr Pinkerton would say as he watched Rodney munching. But the hardest job of all was to keep Rodney clean. First of all, Mr Pinkerton had to hose him down and then scrub him. Scrub, 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 Mr Pinkerton would go. Scrub, scrub, scrub. <sighs> That's one foot done. Mr Pinkerton scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed until he had cleaned all the bits of Rodney he could reach. <sighs> I'm tired and my arms ache, he would sigh. Then he had to get the ladder so he could scrub all the high parts of Rodney. Scrub, scrub, scrub. By the time he had finished, Rodney looked clean and shining. But poor Mr Pinkerton was exhausted. Oh, I wish there was a washing machine big enough to take you, Mr Pinkerton said as he picked up his bucket and brush. But it would need to be huge, wouldn't it? <sighs> Never mind. I'll think of something. See you tomorrow. And he gave Rodney a friendly pat. <whistles> that night, while he was driving home, Mr Pinkerton saw something which gave him an idea. <whistles> morning he could hardly wait to tell Rodney. I think I've solved our problem, he said. Come and see. And leading Rodney by the trunk, Mr Pinkerton took him out of the zoo and along the road to a garage. Look, said Mr Pinkerton, what do you think of that? Rodney looked. Behind the garage was a funny machine with a big sign. It said, Car Wash. Mr Pinkerton led Rodney up to it. The machine had huge green brushes. These are just what we need to give you a good scrub, said Mr Pinkerton. All I do is put in some money 
and the machine does it all for me. Rodney trumpeted gently as if to say, what a good idea. Mr Pinkerton guided Rodney until he was standing in the right place. Then Mr Pinkerton put the money in the slot and stood well back. Whoosh! First, jets of water were sprayed over Rodney, behind his ears, under his tummy and over his back. Are you enjoying it? Mr Pinkerton shouted. Rodney nodded his big head and trumpeted loudly. Then the huge green brushes began spinning and moved slowly up until they were level with Rodney's back. Scrub, 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 they went. Rodney loved it. The brushes scrubbed in all the places Mr Pinkerton couldn't reach. And then they did it all over again. This is great, yelled Mr Pinkerton. Isn't it, Rodney? At last, after a final hose down, the brushes slipped back to their usual place and the machine stopped. My, you do look smart, said Mr Pinkerton. Washing you like this is so much easier. And Mr Pinkerton and Rodney marched proudly back home to the zoo. Grown-up clothes. Grown-up clothes are fun to play with. Find some old ones if you can. Stand on a chair with Dad's big coat on. Pretend you're as tall as a full-grown man. Pull Mum's skirt up to your neck and ask a friend to hold your waist. Make believe you're a galloping horse who loves to run and jump and race. Put your feet in Dad's old shoes and find a crumpled hat and scarf. Be a circus clown and tumble round the ring to make folks laugh. <laughs> if you've got a pair of trousers, you can run three-legged races. You and a friend take one leg each, but don't trip up upon the braces. Dad's old shirt becomes an apron. Tie the arms to make a bow. Now your clothes just can't get dirty. Round the kitchen you can go. Walking sticks are good for sportsmen. Put the handle on the floor. Make some balls from pairs of socks. And you've got cricket, golf and more. No. Doris, help! There's a giant in the room. I'm the tallest, most enormous hamster who's ever been seen on Magic Mountain. Don't worry, Jane. It's only Morris playing games. Morris, take Dottie's coat off and get down off that chair. <laughs> I bet you didn't know who it was. No, but I wasn't really frightened. I was just playing too. <laughs> Time for another story now. Oh, good! What is it? The Sunflower and the Rosebush. The little sunflower stood in the garden beside the tall red rose bush. Looking high above himself, he saw her in full bloom. Her rose petals smelt beautiful. Oh, I wish I could be tall and beautiful like you, sighed the little sunflower. You will one day, said the rose bush. Just wait until the sun shines. When will that be? asked the sunflower. Very soon. Then you'll be bigger than me. Oh, goody, chuckled the sunflower. I can't wait. Weeks went by and still there was no sun. The sunflower was very unhappy. <laughs> I'm never going to get any bigger. He sobbed. Come, come, said the rose bush, bending down low. Now stop that crying. Here, dry your eyes. Taking a rose petal, the little sunflower dried his eyes and wiped his face. 
You've got to give the sun some time, said the rose bush. Maybe it'll shine for you tomorrow. Why do I have to wait for the sun? asked the sunflower. You'll soon see, said the rose bush. The little sunflower wished and wished for the sun. He dreamt of being as tall and as beautiful as the rose bush beside him, and of smelling as lovely as she did. <coughs> Next morning, the bright sun filled the blue sky. Day after day it shone, making everyone hot. Slowly, but steadily, the little sunflower began to grow. His green stem grew longer, and his yellow petals opened with delight. Soon he was no longer a small sunflower, he was bigger than the rose bush. Hello up there. Feel better now? asked the rose bush. Yes, thanks, said the sunflower. Now I know why I had to wait for the sun. It's because I am a sunflower, and I need the sun to make me tall. Chuckling, the two friends enjoyed the midday heat. I wonder how tall I'll grow, said the sunflower. Wait and see, replied the rose bush. I'm so glad the sunflower finally grew up. Why? Because sunflowers are meant to be tall. Just like hamsters are meant to be small. Exactly. We like being small, don't we, Morris? Of course we do, Doris. Shall we sing our song? Why not? One, One two, two, three, four. When you're a hamster, everyone's bigger than you. Shaking hands with Leroy means bouncing up and down like a kangaroo. But we like being tiny, we like being small. Small is beautiful, small is good. We'd be even smaller if we could. When you're small, people always help you. When you're small, you can sleep in a drawer. When you're small, there's never any danger of banging your head on the wardrobe door. When you're small, people always help you. When you're small, you can sleep in a drawer. When you're small, there's never any danger of banging your head on the wardrobe door. When you're small, when you're small, when you're small. 